Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and welcome back to another faction preview for Total War Warhammer 3, as we finish up with the Kislev factions with Katrin of the Ice Court. Now since we already covered the Kislev shared mechanics in our Boris faction preview earlier, this preview will focus mainly on what make Katrin unique. And starting things off, we have the faction effect. For devotion gains, we'll gain 10 additional points for each successful Frost Maiden hero action. This is the opposite of Kistalton, who gets 10 points for each Patriarch hero action, and the Patriarch and Frost Maiden are the two hero type available to Kislev factions. We'll also gain 6 points of control for all our settlements. This is fairly nice to counteract some of the higher difficulty penalties to control. I believe on Legendary it's minus 8 points and this would get rid of most of that. Then for hero recruitment rank, we get plus 3 for Frost Maidens, and this is kind of combling with our Ice Court training duration of minus 2 turns. The Ice Court trains Frost Maiden heroes or Ice Witch Lords, and typically it's 8 turns. For us, it's 6 turns by default, and we can reduce that by 2 more turns through the tech tree for 4 turns, which is the bare minimum because there will be 4 dilemmas during the training where you pick the first one for the lore of magic, whether it's Tempest or Ice, and the final 3 is random assortment of bonuses you can pick from, and that will customize your Frost Maiden or your Ice Witch Lord for you to recruit onto the field after that. And you also get plus 4 rank during this duration, so in the end Frost Maidens will start out at 7 rank for us, which is quite nice. Uh, the max rank is 50, so it's a little bit of a head start, but not enough to make a huge difference, but still nice to get that head start. Then for Lord Effect, or the effect for Katrin herself, wherever she stands, the local province will be reducing minus 6 points of corruption. This is very useful, given the multitude of corruptions and rifts opening up throughout your campaign, as well as just conquering land of Skavens, Vampires, and all sorts of Chaos Gods, and you just want to reduce that corruption down so you don't suffer from attrition and other negative effects. Then for units, Ice Guards will be our specialty as we'll have minus 50% upkeep for Ice Guard units in our Lord's Army. There are two variations of Ice Guards, the Dual Sword and the Glaive, and both of those will have that benefit. And finally, for our spell casting, there's a minus 50% of miscast, which is quite nice. In terms of our starting location, we start out kind of in the middle of Kislev, where Kislev the city is. We hold that one province city. Uh, it's quite nice. Uh, to our west, Kostaltans on that area. We start out in a couple wars with different Kislev factions who are friendly to Kostaltan, but you could technically fight your way to a peace deal with them and slowly try to absorb them through confederation, because as we mentioned, going to war with fellow Kislev factions is counterintuitive in that you don't gain supporters by fighting them, and that really limits your the motherland mechanic, where you ultimately can confederate uh, Kostaltan as Katrin, so that is something we want to work uh, towards. And with that said, we're going to hop into the first turn here and take a look at everything. And this is the settings just for a quick peek. A nation in mourning. False news has arrived before me. They believe Urson is already dead. My proposition will require a delicate touch. I speak the truth. Your god is not dead. He lies in the realm of chaos, a captive of the Shadow Lord. It is no lie. For one drop of Urson's blood, I can help you save him. Choose your last words wisely, old man. Through your bloodline, you and the bear are one. See past your grief. Search your heart. Urson 
is alive. He speaks the truth. He speaks the truth. Silence! We have lost what is most precious. Many say I am at fault. That I no longer have the right to sit on this throne. So I stand. I stand with my people. All of you. And if it comes to it, I shall die with my people. We have been blinded by grief. Ursun lives. And while he fights to draw breath, we fight for him! For Ursun! For Kislev! For Ursun! For Kislev! For Ursun! Kislev! For Ursun! For Kislev! For Ursun! For Kislev! For Ursun! Kislev marches north into hell. Our goal is to rescue Urson, the god bearer of Kislev, from the clutches of Belako. After fraught bargaining, my price is agreed, and I will do all I can to guide the Kislevites to their lost god. Come then, before I change my mind and cast you into the ice. Advise me. Your Highness, there are enemies close by that threaten your throne. If we are to save Urson, they must be dealt with first. The Maelstrom has forced Northmen, worshippers of the Dark Powers, into Kislev lands. They have taken Gerslev. Slay the trespassers. These incursions and the endless winter have sown doubt in the subjects of your burgeoning reign. Followers of the great orthodoxy resent your rule. Pacify such malcontents through diplomatic means or martial might. Kostaltin, the supreme patriarch of Urson's cult, is the instigator of this rebellious feeling. He must be dealt with. If left to fester, it shall cause a schism from which Kislev will never recover. Fortunately, there are allies to be found on our borders, to the west and south. Foster alliances with the Empire and those Kislevite tribes who have always been loyal to your bloodline. There is much to do, Your Highness, if the Motherland is to be secured and your god saved. Let us begin. Alrighty. So we kind of got our flyby. Our early game mission is to fight off uh, the army in front of us. And just taking a look, we're surrounded by uh, Prague, which is another Kislev faction that we have to fight. Uh, they have a couple land in the Eastern Oblast, and that's kind of your early game objective. I highly recommend you going out and fighting uh, or uniting the Eastern Oblast, but then going to peace with them. And then instead of fighting Prague, you can just confederate them once you become a lot bigger because they'll be stuck with basically just one settlement here. And eventually confederation would just benefit you a lot better. You can confederate all the Kislev factions this way, uh, except for Kristalton who kind of hates you. Uh, you can use the motherland mechanic to get him. And once we do fight off this army in front of us, we will pick up a Frost Maiden and we'll take a look at what she can bring us in terms of her abilities on the field. And that will give us 10 points of devotion each. And devotion is quite important because it keeps incursion chance low. Uh, if you get it high enough, this chance will become zero. And you can also use it for the different invocations against the gods of Kislev. I recommend to save this up until the late game where you have multiple armies to fight multiple battles or multiple targets to occupy multiple characters so they can all gain rank during the 10 turn this is active to gain more supporters or have lots of land under your control so the buildings can be constructed you know in multitudes because the cost will stay relatively the same they all go up by a little maybe over 100 but that's about it but the return of how many supporters you can gain which is the main purpose of this mechanic is very key and you can also pick up tech from the tech tree that will help bolster each of these effects by adding additional effects to the bonuses and that can bring a lot of benefits. You can use your early devotion on religious buildings to kind of help bolster passive devotion gain and also passive supporter gain as well. 
And since you are in a race to gain supporters all the way to 600, uh, there's breakpoints of over 50, over 100, over 200, over 400. You want to hit these key points to pick up the bonuses on them, uh, which will improve your relationship with other Kislev factions and help you confederate them, of course. And if Gestalton is gaining on you, you can pay up 5,000 cash or 200 devotion every 20 turns for each of these mechanics. So technically within a 20 turn frame, you could use both of these for minus uh, 50 points or 50 point each. So minus 100 total. And you can just keep him low while keeping you high. Uh, when you hit 600, you will confederate Gestalton's faction peacefully. And of course, because Boris is in the game and no longer a surprise, if we're able to hold the city of Kislev, the city of Prague, as well as Erringard, which is at the mouth of the Lynx River over here. It's also owned by a Kislev faction that we can confederate pretty easily. For 10 consecutive turns, you'll be able to pick up the quest to pick up Boris. And that time you could give him a piece of land, one of the three cities, and have him as a new faction in the game, or just have him work for you, which definitely should be recommended. And you end up picking up all three Kislev Lords in your faction. Uh, quite fun to play that way. But what makes us slightly unique in the beginning has to go to our character. So we've already seen all the campaign effect bonuses on our Lord. We use a lot of spells from Lore of Ice and I'm not going to really go over all the ones you can pick up. We'll have separate guides for a skill tree. We'll just mainly talk about what makes her slightly unique compared to other characters because Pretty much all the Ice Witches have a bunch of Lore of Ice spell and you can always go to the spell browser to take a look at all their effects. What we have going for us is Guarding Call, which means we can summon units. We can summon a Snow Leopard. Now personally, I don't think Snow Leopards are very strong. They're very fragile, very low health, only around 3k health, and they're a single entity that only deals melee damage. So once they dip below 25% health, they actually lose a big chunk of their damage as well. And they are also not unbreakable. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're the only unit without the buy our blood trait. So, you know, on paper, they're just not that great. And you can summon them. They will decay over time because this is a summoned unit. And you can also increase their melee attack and melee defense with more tearing up of the uh, skill here. But what's more important is if you hit level 16, you can pick up Snow Leopard stock which will give all your Snow Leopards in your Lord's Army, Katrin's Army, 10% speed and stock. Stock might make them worth it because then you can sneak into defenses around enemy flanks. And that would open up some options of sniping out enemy heroes, um, but you're still a pretty weak you know, single entity unit. So your uses are still limited, but taking key points inside settlements, especially given the new sort of tower defense mode. You can pick up points and just destroy all the towers and constructible in that area. That is still very useful. For Katrin, uh, obviously as a spell user, our main special line here will focus kind of on spells. We'll make all the Winds of Magic cheaper for all her core spells. And she will also get more hit points, more armor, more weapon strength. We'll gain plus six points of leadership and eight points of melee defense for all the Ice Guard units. Those are the ones that will give 50% upkeep in her army, also very useful. We'll have plus 10% speed. Uh, we travel on a block of ice, so that kind of makes sense. And then we are the Con Queen, very similar to our father, uh, has a very similar skill here. We'll gain increased diplomatic relations with all of Kislev, plus two devotion passive gain per turn, and plus one control. And then finally, Shield of Ice. This will give us 8% ward save for our entire army. So 8% damage resistance for Katrin's army. This is quite strong and uh, highly recommend to pick up this tree once you hit rank 12. You basically need uh, rank 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and bam, you have 8% damage resistance for the entire army. And I think that's definitely well worth rushing. Uh, everything else is just spells and regular stuff to boost your troops as well as some campaign uh, efficiency. So that's Katrin's setup. For quest battles, at rank 7, we'll get a free weapon, the Frost Fang, keeping the upkeep of our army lower, increased loot, cheaper recruitment as well, and plus 6 melee attack, enable magical attack. This is kind of wasted on us because we already have that by default. If we're going to give this weapon over to someone else uh, that does not have this, for example, if we have uh, Adaman who, or Boyer, 
We can give them the Frost Fang, their attack will become magical and they'll bypass physical resistances. 10% additional weapon strength overall added to the character and the added ability of Frost Fang, which is a spell that is two use only. It's a explosion damage, a radius of 15 meters, range of 200 meters, and the damage of 29 there. Um, I think that's like pretty much per, I mean, the, the numbers, it takes a while to explain. So it's, it's okay. It's not a super damaging heavy spell. It's a nice area clear for clusters of enemy units. Let's just put it that way. And then we have a quest battle for our unique armor, the Crystal Cloak. This will be available to you at rank 10. You can teleport an army there anytime to fight it. It's an ambush battle with Zinch enemies, which is actually super annoying, but uh, pretty doable if you have a decent army. Just be ready that it's going to be an ambush fight. You will get plus 6 armor. You get minus 10% enemy hero success chance. Minus 1 wound recovery time, which is interesting. I wonder if this can be combined with uh, Kustalton. Uh, effect if a consultant picks this up because he already has minus four wound time wonder what happens when you have minus five six points of melee defense 10 percent ward saves another 10 percent damage resistance for just the character wearing it and the crystal cloak which will increase damage resistance by 20 percent uh, for 31 seconds while casting so when you're casting you activate the crystal cloak ability it's good for spell users so obviously as katrin this will be quite useful and that's pretty much her character bonus and we can we can jump into the fight because we talked about the buildings we talked about the tech before in all the other kids that preview so if you missed out on that definitely go check that out and we'll just fight this one here now our army isn't terribly interesting but i think we'll still showcase it because we do have ice guards and ice guards are going to be pretty core to uh, Katrin's faction, so we might as well showcase them. They're all hybrid units. They're all mainly range units, a lot of ammo, magic attack across the board, and the two that we have here are both the sword variety, so they have the dual swords. Uh, we also have a snow leopard, which I mentioned not that great of a unit, just because it's too fragile. No armor and very low health. That's kind of the thing, but we'll try to make use of this. Alrighty, uh, we won't gamble with the magic, we'll just start deployment and we'll keep all of them in the front because all of them have a little bit of range. Every single unit will activate both firewell and the melee mode. We'll try to use some spells. We start out with two of them, uh, Ice Maiden's Kiss, which is sort of a cone shape attack. And the ice sheet, which is a slow hex. I believe, I believe the enemy just have a bunch of melee units. Marauders, marauders. Oh, they have marauder hunters, so they do have some range. I believe these are javelin, actually. Um, we'll try to flank those, and then warhounds. And we'll just happily let them walk into our range. Uh, the two ice witches here have longer range. They don't have a lot of armor, so I'm actually going to intercept those hounds. And we're going to cast a little spell here. I do have to walk into range, but I think I timed it okay. No, maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. It's okay. And okay, see if we can slow them down. Protect our ice guards, sort of protect our ice guards, and he's really useless. We'll have him flank the enemy um, range unit there just to stop their attack. We're gonna pull away, let them deal with it. Mm, we'll keep our range, it's fine. Want to use another spell? We'll get there soon. What did the leopard go? There we go. Chase that down. And there's not a lot of mass on this guy, so like we're not gonna do a lot of you know disruption 
into enemy formation either. Especially since we're just a single entity. And then, once we get hacked, like, we lose health pretty fast. Here, we'll help him out. Let me get a spell in here. Ah, oh, so satisfying. Most of them will get up, but still. Got the damage in. Now we charge. Alright, dual sword, let's go. And the flank is activated. We're not a very good physical damage dealer, but we'll try our best. Alright, we'll just take care of that. We'll be fine. There is an anti-large um, damage on this, but I don't think their lord is large by any, any means. Alright, just harass that. Army loss kicked in, so we don't have to fight him. And that's that. There's going to be a lot of spell casting as Katrin. Uh, ice guards are nice, but not the most solid front line. They don't have a lot of armor. Decent range, magic damage. Um, they can make up the bulk of the army, but not the entire thing. That's my opinion of them. Ooh. Strider. Okay. Uh, we'll pick up some extra income. Doesn't really matter. Or devotion if you want. Early game devotion is worth a lot because of the incursion. Now the key is... We got ourselves a Frost Maiden, and we can take a look at what she can do. So if you add her into the army, then the embedded effect is scouting, which will increase the chance of finding magic items after battle, can be improved by percentage. If she stands on the field, the passive effect is increase income boost, which can also be increased with skill level. Enemy settlements will allow you to decrease your research time by 20% for three turns. The percentage can also be improved by skill level. This one's actually quite useful in my opinion. And uh, you probably want to do this quite a bit to improve your, uh, not only your technology gain, but also your devotion. Because each successful action by a Frost Maiden hero will give you 10 points of devotion. Enemy heroes can be assassinated. So if you target, you know, whatever faction, if you're attacking another Kizla faction, then their Patriarch and their Frost Maiden on the field, you can snipe them and assassinate them. You can also target an army and pick a unit in the army and damage that unit. Uh, usually it's the leading lord uh, pretty much just wipes out about half of their health. Uh, it's useful, but um, I still don't think that's the most useful way to use it. Uh, I prefer the first two, but all three are great abilities and can be used to help build up your devotion. So keeping them on the field is pretty useful. Obviously their main benefit of being in the army, aside from helping you get item, is that they're a spellcaster themselves. So you can spell, you can spam like different ice spells or tempest spells, depending on what lore you are, uh, as you join the army. So that's pretty much everything you need to know for Catrin's faction. Uh, early on, as I said, you probably want to expand east a little bit first, as your first major enemy is there. And also, Prague's faction also has land holdings in the eastern plus three of them. Wipe out all three. At that point, they should probably be willing to sue for peace, given if you're strong enough. And I recommend you do that and slowly confederate them. It takes them a while to forgive you for being at war with them, but I just don't feel like it's worth wasting manpower to take down Prague. They kind of hold down the fort for you in terms of like absorbing enemy pressure coming towards Kislev. Because your western front is pretty safe. This is a friendly Kislev action that you will eventually be able to confederate pretty easily. They are pretty fond of you. I believe they also own uh, Erengrad. So once you confederate them, you pick up Erengrad. To your south, you have Empire factions who are easy trade partners. Uh, there are some Vampire threats over here, uh, Svalvenias over here. Uh, they are quite annoying because of the corruption on the land. You could either avoid them, but if you do ally yourself with some Empire faction, they're probably going to drag you into a war with them. Um, you might want to send an army down because you're almost at the edge of the map. If you do take them out and take care of the land so the corruption is gone, then you don't have to worry about them ever again. Most of your other enemies will come from the north as well as the east uh, into these high passes, mountain range, and beyond. Uh, you'll be dealing mostly with, um, I guess over here will be a lot of Skavens actually. Uh, not too hard to fight at all. You can expand quite easily. No one's really here in the plain of Tsar. Obviously, uh, Boris will start over here, but since Boris is not 
going to be a faction on the field uh, when you are playing as Katrin, you don't have to worry about that. So this is a pretty easy land grab. And once you expand over here, you obviously have the choice of going north to take on some of the Chaos factions or continue east into the Ogre factions. The idea is just to make yourself strong, strong enough to confederate the other Kislev factions. And once you do that, then obviously it's about the Rift play, gathering their souls and eventually saving Urson. Because that's kind of the goal of the campaign. So hopefully you enjoyed this guide uh, for a preview of Katrin's faction as we wrap up all three of our Kisla factions. And we'll be moving the on to Slanesh, which is the last major faction we have not covered once the embargo drops tomorrow, actually. So we'll see you guys then. Bye!